unfinished business. In May, Australian of the Year Professor Fiona Stanley was our guest. And what she had to say about Australia being a toxic society and the effect this was having on our kids shocked many viewers. This is a public health issue so big, she said, that what we need is a community service campaign like the Grim Reaper one about AIDS in the 80s to cut through public consciousness. We put out a challenge to advertising agencies to an overwhelming response and you'll see the results shortly. But first, let's go back to May and remind ourselves of Fiona Stanley's warning. Well, I think it's actually very worrying and I think we're seeing incredible increases in, in children who are just not able to cope with the education system. We're seeing an epidemic of four and five and six and seven year olds with behaviour problems. I was, I was approached by uh, someone from the Premier's Department in New South Wales the other day and they said there's a group of 11 year olds in New South Wales that they've never seen these kind of kids before. They're not able to foster them, they're not able to educate them and they absolutely uh, feel they're on a path to violence. Will you please welcome the Australian of the Year, Fiona Stanley. Welcome back. Fiona, thanks for coming back to Enough Road. Mm -hmm. Now, you, since then, you've been travelling around Australia spreading this message, but you say the politicians and the bureaucrats still aren't hearing you. What is it that they're not getting? Well, I think that they're certainly getting the message about children, and I think they're certainly concerned about the uh, issues in terms of the early years and all of the things that I, I think that we've been getting across very well. I guess the major thing that people really aren't getting is how important this is for the nation, how important this is for our whole society. I can't think of a more important one, given that the children who are now passing through and having these problems are going to be parents, uh, workforce people, um, people who are going to be the future capacity of Australia in 10 and 15 years' time. You, you said that more and more families are dropping out of society. Why is that? Well, I think if you look at what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years, that um, the kinds of factors that are um, driving neighbourhoods to be less trustful, that are putting families apart, if you look at the hours that people work, they're excessive or they're, in fact, inadequate to support their family. So you get these sort of bipolar look at the workforce where you've got an excessive number of pe people working far too many hours and numbers of people who are, in fact, in a casual work environment, particularly single parents, who aren't able to um, support their families appropriately. And how do you realistically fix that without changing the entire workplace? Well, I think that what we have to look at is the kinds of policies that have, have, have worked in other countries, like the Scandinavian countries, like um, some of the European countries. And I think that when you look at some of those policies, and we, we have to do the research on this, I'm not saying that we have all the answers. And I think the other message that we need to have is that we don't have all the answers, but there are countries that are doing better than us, and let's look at that. With respect, you're Australian of the Year and you're saying Australia's not bloody good enough. I mean, it's, this is, I just, I think you should be disqualified. <laughs> I think basically Australia can, is a fantastic country and as I've gone around to so many of the communities, I have just been inspired by what's happening in communities. What sort of things? Places like Sherberg, for example which is an Aboriginal community where lots of the stolen generation were and everyone talks about alcohol and violence, go to Sherberg, there it is. We laughed for two days. I had two days with the most inspirational group of Aboriginal leaders that you could ever wish to meet. Um, Philip Mills up in the Torres Strait, who's an islander, head of the entire health service for the Northern Peninsula area and the Torres Strait, doing fantastically inspirational things. What sort of, th because we only do ever hear that dark side, what we sort do. of things, for instance, in Sherberg, are they doing in that community? Oh, well, one of the most that? things which was inspirational for me is one of the, uh, the, 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 the house where, the safe children's house, where children could go and be protected and safe. It was incredibly important. Underfunded, but important. The other was, uh, I hope I'm going to get this right, because I know they're going to be watching, and that's Gundu which is the place where uh, children have their preschool and their very early um, uh, childcare. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the children there are being given very appropriate stimulation, the loving care given by, a very, by all Aboriginal people who are employed on it. So those sorts of things are inspirational and they're doing it in spite of, uh, as well as because of, the kinds of government funding that is there. You said in your address to the National Press Club earlier this year that almost 20% of teenagers are going to deal with some form of men mental illness, yes. which is a s staggering statistic. Yes. Why haven't we heard more of this? Well, we've been trying to put these uh, information around for a long time. The research is there. It's there in Canada. Um, actually, um, it's uh, a bit less in some of the countries I've been mentioning, but in the developed world on the whole, about one in five teenagers, and I'm afraid now, um, 20 to 30 year olds have a significant mental illness. And this applies to Australia equally? That's right, that's right. You also said that since the 1970s in the age group 15 to 19 mm. males, mm. the 
uh, incidence of suicide has increased fourfold. Four times, yeah. Why is that? Well, if you look at all of the sorts of things that are pathways to mental ill health and, and to suicide, every single one of those pathways has actually been increasing. And at the same time, a lot of services for children have actually been um, stopped or, or, um, or underfunded. Is that a government issue? Is that a, oh, a I think federal, it is. state, it's local a federal government? state and local government issue okay. about if you, you know, talk to a child health nurses, talk to primary school teachers. I mean, they are very worried about that sort of wonderful support that they gave to parents in the, thir you know, the 1970s, 80s. Um, that, a lot of that has been removed or um, is not there anymore. And I think that's had a powerful impact you... on supporting parents through these difficult times. It's, it's challenging having a child. It's very hard. You, mm. In your work, you've spoken to a lot of government ministers, federal yes. through to local. Why is it that the priority is no longer this sort of support for child raising? It's something that I've sort of been pondering because it's something where I think that was, when I was working in child health in the 1970s and 80s, um, I kept on saying to the, to the uh, people that I was working with, which was the state government department, um, we need to get some evidence around the effectiveness of child health nurses because if we can't get the effectiveness, you know, almost like a cost-benefit analysis of child health nurses, we'll be cut, our services will be cut because an economic rational sort of um, mindset was going to come in and I could see. And it's very easy to, to count the costs and it's really hard to count the benefits of some of these things. Have you, you ever to... spoken to the Prime Minister along these lines? Oh yes, well, I think we've, we've managed to get a very good ear um, and I think... He's that... only got one so I hope you got the right one. <laughs> um, I think we've got the ear. I think that there's however um, a concentration on targeting the early years exclusively rather than looking at these bigger pictures and trying to say what is it about government policies that enhance family, what, are, that what I call family enabling, mm. and what are the policies which might in fact if you model them through might actually have a very negative impact on families. Well let's talk about the message. When you were here last time you yes. said we need an, an ad campaign, something that's going to cut through like the Grim Reaper mm. one mm. Uh, for AIDS in the 80s and we threw out the challenge to advertising yes, agencies and uh, we were absolutely overwhelmed. These two files here are the responses that we got um, <clears throat> from people all over Australia, many of whom were advertising professionals, many weren't health professionals, just parents that wanted to help out. I think you were pretty amazed yourself I when was you a, saw the I response. I was absolutely warmed. I actually must say, Andrew, that the response after the last interview um, was overwhelming and a lot of people um, emailed and, and uh, phoned and said thank you. So well, I, I felt very I think a, chuffed by that. Well, you should. A lot of people instinctively understood yeah, that yeah. what you were saying was, was core to Australia's future. Now, out of these many applications, we narrowed it down to three <laughs> advertising agencies. And at this point, I'd like to thank the, the two runners-up who not only contributed with huge spirit, but gave some great ideas yeah, uh, to your institute that are going to help further. And that's uh, Mojo and Host, who are just fantastic. And thank you for your generosity. The winning agency are called Hammond and Thackeray. And we've got a whole lot of them here tonight, actually. And they've created a free of charge, three community service announcements, along the themes Fiona has been talking about, the first one of which we're going to show you now. This is the time when problems in life begin. Because the way we treat children in the first years of life can profoundly affect their future. But creating a nurturing environment for them is not only the job of parents. We can all help make sure children get the best start in life. Now, I should point out that they're community service announcements. Uh, they're unpaid announcements, so it's, it's beholden on the ABC, certainly, and commercial networks to play those free of charge and to... I know people at commercial <coughs> networks watch this show. When they do come across your desk, we'd appreciate it if you play them. That's a 30-second ad. There are, there are three of those. What do you hope they'll achieve? Well, I think that uh, the aim is that it really will actually raise awareness. Um, but in doing that, I think we, we had to make sure that we could respond to that, and that's why we've got the website putchildrenfirst.org.au because I think it, it is really important that we just don't go away into the ether and then present nothing else. So in raising awareness you've then got to deliver some information and some, uh, and some other stuff. But I do think it's a very powerful community service announcement, it really is. Isn't it also important, you don't want people to look at something like that or hear what you're saying and be filled with despair or hopelessness. Exactly. 
Uh, yes. it's, this is not about criticising people's parenting, it's about offering them support, yes. is that right? Yes, and about, say, giving hope for the future that we actually can turn this around. I mean, there are ways and means to do so at every level, you know, within families, within neighbourhoods, local government, all of these things, there's a message there. Um, so I'm, I, I'm just in, in, interested to see how it's going to go. And I think uh, we should acknowledge the, uh, Daniel Petrie and the Petrie Foundation who've made a substantial donation to, to uh, set that website up and make it happen. Mm. Is what you're hoping to create ultimately, uh, it's perhaps too weak a term, a, a, a national conversation where people feel free to talk about something perhaps they haven't spoken about before, which is their own misgivings perhaps about their own parenting, about how children, children are being raised, where there is a, a broader community mm. than simply the, That's a really the other good people thought, in your house. actually, Andrew, because I think a lot of people feel it's very easy to feel guilty. I had maternal guilt for most of my, <laughs> my working life because I thought I should have been at home. Mm. Um, there are so many things. It's so easy to make people feel bad about themselves. What we want to do is to say to parents, you know, we know that you're the most important people in Australian society. Um, you need help to be the people who are creating a future for Australia that's positive and wonderful. But you need advice, you need help, you need support for that. And I think that, uh, and, and, and also for parents to realise that they're not alone and that th the difficulties that they may be having are just so universal. I mean, what do you do with that teenager out late at night, you know, and you don't know where they are and they, oh, that, that fear and how to actually, what kind of strategies mm. are helpful, those sorts of things, that's the kind of help. Yeah. If you, if I were the Prime Minister, Hmm. Is this a... No one laughed. No, no. <laughs> You're they, losing your time. They should have. <laughs> if I were the Prime Minister, what would you be saying to me now? Well, I think that what I'd be saying is that this is an issue that's bigger than just um, the early years or parenting programs. This is an issue that's really, really important for Australia. It's important for our future. It's important for our future economy. It's, a for, it's important for our future cultural, artistic, sporting and economic uh, capacity that we put children first. And what happens when you hand the sash back, the Australian of the Year sash? What, what will you do? Well, I think basically it's not going to change that much, Andrew. I've got so many invitations to speak next year as well. I don't know how I'm going to manage next year. But um, I'll, again, I'll grab, it, I'll grab the opportunity to put, put these issues forward. I can't think of anything more important. That's fantastic that you are, Fiona Stanley. Australian of the Year, thank you so much for being with us again. Thank you. Right now, it's time for Show and Tell. <laughs> Renee Johnson, are you here tonight, Renee? Yeah. Hi, Renee, how are you? Thank you. Good. Welcome to the show. Good. That's, oh, 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 sorry. Nothing personal. <laughs> now, the moment in your life when you were most scared, Renee? Uh, that moment was um, about three years ago. Uh, I got a phone call from my brother. And um, he said to me, oh, have you seen Dad? And I said, oh, no, I haven't seen him today. And, I, yeah, he was supposed to pick up Nana, like, yesterday and take her to the hospital. And um, I hung up the phone and I sort of... I immediately sort of thought, yeah, I think something's wrong here. And cos he hadn't been well for about five years. And, um, yeah, I started to get a bit scared then. I sort of knew. And then by the time we started driving down there, I was sort of preparing myself for what I was going to find. And I sort of uh, opened the gate and uh, all the papers were on the ground and my note was there from when I had popped in and he didn't answer the door. And uh, I found his body on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. How was that moment? It was a very intense moment. Um, uh, he was lying on the ground um, in his bedroom naked, like, and it was sort of, you know, you're born naked and... Mm. and um, I looked him in the eyes and I sort of walked out, of, I was sort of running out of the house and um, I was floating on air, if you can imagine, mm -hmm. and um, I started taking my clothes off as well, like just my jacket and um, it was raining and it was just, I stood on the corner at the park and um, my partner was, thank goodness, there and I looked him in the eyes and I just I was going to be okay. You know? yeah. I needed that, I uh, needed to look him in the eyes and, and find myself, so yeah. They say that it's important uh, for grieving to see the body, even though that's not the way you would have chosen to see your father mm. in death. Mm. When you look back on it, are you glad that you were the one that found it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because it was on his terms, you know. Mm. He was at home and 
and it was my brother and me, his his children, and um, I look at it in that in that way, like it wasn't in a, in a sterile hospital or anything, mm. and he wasn't. I mean, it was quick. It was a heart attack, and yeah, yeah. I guess that's <laughs> pretty much it. Well, that's a lovely story. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you. While I'm sitting here with Renée, I know there's something else about you that's uh, a little <laughs> unusual, which is uh, of a different note. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, uh, my, my cousin had a... She was a HIV AIDS educator in the community centre um, back in Adelaide. She had a Hep C conference in Brisbane. And um, 